wanted to share with you something that I read this morning. Um, I was reading in the last chapter of Steps to Christ, and it has to do with, I ran across something that has to do with a song that I was planning on singing this morning. So it talks about how we dwell upon our mistakes and failures and disappointments instead of rejoicing in what God has given us. This is about a story that um, Ellen White tells where a fellow believer came to her who had been dwelling upon her mistakes and failures. And so she said after reading this letter, she had a dream. And in the dream, she was in a garden. Um, it said, I dreamt I was in a garden, and one who seemed to be the, gar the owner of the garden was conducting me through its paths. I was gathering flowers and enjoying their fragrance. Fragrance, when this sister, who had been walking by my side, called my attention to some unsightly briars that were impeding our way. Their, um, their unsightly briars that were impeding their way. There she was mourning and grieving. She was not walking in the pathway, following the guide, but was walking among the briars and thorns. Oh, she mourned, is it not a pity that the beautiful garden is spoiled with thorns? Then the guide said, let the thorns alone, for they will only wound you. Gather the roses and the lilies and the pinks. And we know who that gardener was, right? The guide, our, our Heavenly Father. Are, are not God's promises like the fragrant flowers growing beside you and growing beside your path on every hand? And I was kind of inspired by the beautiful flowers that are out right now and the beauties that God shares with us every day if we just take the time to look around and, and appreciate them. So for our opening hymn, or not opening hymn, our first song this morning, we're going to sing, I Come to the Garden, and it's hymn number 487. 487. to the garden Great.
great voice this morning. Let's turn over to hymn number 554, Oh, Let Me Walk With Thee. We're going to continue our theme of walking and being close with God. How wonderful it is just to know that we have the assurance of him being there with us all the time. He's walking with us. Hymn number 554, Oh, Let Me Walk With Thee. Skip it back a couple more pages to hymn number 632, Until Then. So as we journey on through this life, we have the hope, the precious hope in Jesus. And until then, we just need to keep traveling on. Until then, keep singing in your heart. And that's what this song is about. Hymn number 632. I hope that you all know this.
morning and happy Sabbath. Wow. I like the, I just like the, uh, the appearance. Uh, you all look wonderful. But uh, here at Irvington, we want to know that you're alive. And you're doing that for a reason. Do you hear me? Oh, we're, you got an echo. It's just a little bit. One, two, three, four. Ashley? Oh. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We're going to do this again. Good morning and happy Sabbath. There we go. Amen. Amen. Yeah. God knows you're awake now. In our announcements, uh, again, uh, after service, we have potluck here at Irvington, and feel free to stay and fellowship uh, with us. Uh, we have a very special Sabbath, so I'll be out here a little bit. We have baptisms today, and there's four that have made a decision to follow Jesus. Uh, uh, my little background that, uh, I, that the pastor was giving me was you remember when they had the meetings with Sean Boonstra? How many years back that was? Well, they went to Sean Boonstra's meetings. And so it's, I've always said that every meeting that the church has, it doesn't matter if they're not baptized right away. There's a seed set in the heart. And in time, things will happen. So uh, I think that is, that's just wonderful uh, uh, news there. Uh, again, for those of us who are exercising, we are uh, going to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and it is interesting, uh, uh, every 20 minutes of exercise time that you keep uh, equals one mile. Um, Cheyenne is, uh, I don't have my notes, I had them, Cheyenne is 6,066 feet above sea level. A population of 66,000 and a few. Uh, the median price of the home in Cheyenne, Wyoming is $311,000. As if you're exercising and we get there, you want to buy a place. Uh, that's, uh, it. Uh, Cheyenne exists only because of the railroad. Uh, Dennis, railroaders. Our railroader there. Uh, my dad, railroader. Uh, because the uh, Transcontinental uh, Railroad uh, went through there and the surveyors, I uh, don't remember his name, uh, but he made a decision on that point of land, which there was of nothing because it's kind of arid, desert-like uh, at the altitude. But he said that he, he gave it the, um, the term, uh, I don't have it, it's like destination, but it's not the word. But what that meant was in the railroad is that there was likely to be a town there. And so the people took that to heart, those that are around there, because there was nobody, no buildings, nothing, not even trees. And uh, that was 1866, like the middle of 1866, 1867. Uh, the uh, workers brought the rails into that area, and there was 3,000 people waiting on that out of nothing and so it's considered like the miracle city on the plains just some interesting points um, in the bible uh, the name cheyenne has the meaning of grace i think that's wonderful we're exercising to find grace uh, in the lord also um, tomorrow is a kind of important day yes so we're going to have Brittany come up here and talk about you've seen when you walk through the church, there's some strange stuff going on back there. All right. Good morning. I'm going to tell you all like I tell the kids in my classroom, turn your listening ears on right now. So we are starting Jasper Canyon VBS tomorrow. We're having the VBS fun day and it is from two to four. We're going to have an animal show. We're going to have games. We're going to have face paint. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. Um, we're going to have popcorns and snow cones. So please come. That is 2 to 4. 
Now, if you are going to help set up with that, please be here at noon. We have tents to put up, we have games to set up and tables to set up. So if you're gonna help, be here at noon tomorrow and the event starts from two to four. BBS will run from six to eight Monday through Friday. So six to 8 p.m. here at the church. And I have these flyers, if you guys wanna pick them up out front and give them to your friends and family, the flyers are just for the Vacation Bible School. So spread tomorrow's event by word of mouth. And then if you are a teacher or a leader in VBS, please see me after service because I have the schedule. And I'll give a little spoiler, we're having a pizza party Friday night this year with VBS. So there's gonna be some changes to our schedule on Friday night. So please invite all your friends and family. How many here at one time in our life attended VBS? Okay. Did I see you raise your hand? I didn't see you raise your hand. I know you raised your hand. Your brother didn't raise his hand. You got to raise your hand. Uh, VBS is very important uh, to the neighborhood and to the children and the church. A uh, fun way of learning about God. And now something that's not so fun but it needs to be done. Nominating committee. All right, uh, nominating committee has completed their list um, very quickly and efficiently, and I wanna thank the nominating committee for that. Uh, this is the first reading. I'll go through these names, uh, then you will have a chance to uh, look over them. If you have any questions or concerns, you would see the pastor, uh, one of the elders, or myself. All right, church uh, elders. The head elder, William Jeffries, elders Eduardo Lozano, and Anthony Young. Deacons, head deacon Greg Clark, assistant Devin Sanders, deacons Michael Weaver, Joseph Kipp, John Stressman. Deaconesses, head deaconess, Arlene Clark, Deaconesses Karen Beck, Terry Riley, Joanne Sheets, Patty Pinkston, Kiata Thomas, Crystal Riley, Jackie Abdul. Church Bulletin is Crystal Riley, Email Coordinator Susan Jeffries, Church Clerk Brittany Young, Church Treasurer Sue Jeffries, Backup Treasurer is Arlene Clark. Interest Coordinator is Arlene Clark, Personal Ministries Arlene Clark, Personal Ministry Secretary is Crystal Riley. Greeter Coordinator is Terry Riley. Greeters are Patsy Balsimio, Mary Tincher, Carol Beverly, Karen Beck, Saul Sousa, and Jeremy Riley. Health Ministry, Beatrice Frecke. Landscaping, Michael Jeffries. Music Department Head, Karen O'Brien. Piano, Karen O'Brien. Organ is Jackie Abdul. Chorister head is Beatrice Frecking. Chorister is Greg Clark, Renee Copeland, Joseph Kipp, Patty Pinkston, and Eden Frecking. Communications is Brittany Young. Religious Liberty is Michael Weaver. Photographer, Charlotte Dodd and Michael Weaver. Special dinners um, decorating is Karen Beck. Holiday decorating is Terry Riley, Beatrice Frecking. Sabbath School Superintendent, the head is Don Beck. Sabbath School Superintendent, Greg Clark. Patty Pinkston, Joanne Sheets. Sabbath School Supply Clerk and Secretary, Joanne Sheets, Assistant Terry Riley. Sabbath School Treasurer, uh, Sabbath School Teachers, I'm sorry. Sanctuary Class for Adults is Bill Jeffries, Greg Clark. Anthony Young, Michael Weaver, and Joseph Kipp. Sabbath School Division Cradle Roll is Patty Pinkston, Brittany Young. Kindergarten is Susan Jeffries. Junior, Kiata Thomas. Backup teacher is Beatrice Frecking. Audiovisual sound leader, Michael Weaver. Assistants, Jeremy Riley, Joseph Kipp. Calling post, Arlene Clark. Assistant, Susan Jeffries. VBS to, to our 2023 is Brittany Young, uh, Women's Ministry Coordinator, Ashley Weaver, Assistant Beatrice Frecking, 
Children's story is Ashley Weaver. Social programs, leader is Terry Riley. Uh, uh, assistants are Crystal and Jeremy Riley. Safety officer is Eddie Lozano. And prayer ministry coordinator is Brittany Young. Again, if you have any questions or comments, uh, bring them directly to the pastor, one of the elders, or myself. And we will go over these and vote on them next week. Thank you. Amen. First of all, in the past, this is the first Sabbath in June. Uh, these uh, take place, uh, positions change in July, first Sabbath of July. And a lot of times here at Irvington, I hate to say, we are right up against the line. But because of you saying yes and the work of the committee, we're done. Except for uh, if you do have a question, you can pass, uh, contact the pastor or myself. And uh, that's, just, that's just amazing. So I believe we're going to enter into the church service. Your scripture is Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5, and it's verses 1 and 2 to start our service and uh, put our mind in the uh, correct thinking. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. like to mention to please at this time remember to silence your electronic devices as we enter into the worship service. Uh, we'll begin with the invocation, the call to worship. It's found on the inside of your bulletin. The top left.
O oh Lord, we are so thankful for the invitation to come and be with you on this Sabbath morning. We give thanks for the bright, sunsh bright sunshine that you have given us. And also, Father, uh, today as we baptize four people into your kingdom, we say thank you for these things we ask in your name. Amen. Opening hymn, hymn number 10. Hymn 10, come Christians, join and sing. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's good to see you all here today. Glad that you made it out. Of course, it's a very special day because we're going to have um, some baptisms. And I want to tell you a little bit about, come on up. I want to tell you a little about this family um, that uh, is going to be baptized. I guess you two are friends. You're not related. You're friends, right? And uh, Vincent here, he came to the Sean Boonster meeting several years ago. He made contact with Dr. Bill. They've remained friends since then. And then uh, Monday came to the meeting at La Quinta. And did you tell him about it? Is that how it worked? Yes. Okay, so then he brought him, and they came almost every night. Now, Amande brought his son some of the nights, Christian, and then when, Vin sorry for all these names, but when Vincent would go home and what he was learning, he would tell his mother, who also wants to be baptized as well. And I was very impressed with them because not only did they come to the meetings that we did at the La Quinta, but they also went to Pastor Ted's meetings. And I wasn't sure, you know, if they wanted to wait a while and see about joining the church, but I gave them all the beliefs, a very thorough detail of it, and they all said, yes, we want to be baptized. And so it's a privilege to have them part of our church. I'm going to read to you the baptismal vows, and they've gone over these. And I just want you to raise your hand if you agree with these. So the first one is, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with him? Okay, very good. Number two, do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventist Church, and do you pledge by the grace of God to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Yes, I do. And the last one is, do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your belief in Jesus Christ, 
and to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and to support the church in its mission and its purpose. Yes, I do. Okay, amen. Well, pending baptism in just a few moments, can we get a motion that we accept these four into our fellowship? Okay, motions are second. So I'll second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to depart. You guys will just continue on with the church service. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, if you have a prayer that you want some, us to pray over, there's prayer cards uh, in front of you. Fill it out. And when I get done reading scripture, uh, I guess Phil will collect them in his Bible. And today I'm reading from Revelation 7, 1 through 4. It says here, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the cor uh, four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. One hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And now Bill will come down with his Bible and collect any uh, prayer requests that he'd like us to pray over. All who are able, shall we kneel for prayer? Again, our most heavenly, kind Heavenly Father, we come to you in like fashion with bowed heads and bent knees before you, the creator of all things, the giver of life to each and every one of us. Father, we're thankful, thankful for this invitation that you have given the world to come and be with you on Sabbath mornings. And today, Father, you see each and every soul here today. Lord, we ask for a blessing now on this ceremony of baptism of four individuals making a decision for you. Lord, we pray now earnestly that you will protect them and guard them. We know that in the walk of life, and now especially, the devil does not like the decision that they are making. And so we pray now for their heavenly angels to guard them and protect them. Give them strength. Lord, we ask that as a church family, we will come to be their brothers and sisters, helping arm in arm as they walk this new life that they have chosen to be with you. Father, we pray for this church, all churches, as we proclaim the three angels' message to the world, we ask a special blessing upon our young people, for we know that it is they who will give extra strength to this message. And so, Lord, I pray for our parents and grandparents as leaders in their lives that they will uphold Jesus to them and that Jesus will become their best friend as they walk through the life. Lord, we pray that you will grant each person here a blessing that they have come to receive. Lord, you know each of us personally. You know the things that we have walked through this past week or in our whole lives. You know what station of mind that we're in right here today. 
Lord, I pray for healing, for joy, whatever the need is, you know. May we all be drawn closer to you, drawn towards heaven as we listen to this message and see these individuals be baptized into your church. Again, Father, we pray for this church, the leadership, a new year as it approaches, and that we will do your will and not man's. And so we ask now that every person here in this sanctuary, every person who watches, every person who hears, will be granted according a place in the clouds when you come. For these things we ask in your name. Amen.
Our offering today is for the local church budget. Revelation 18.3 tells us, For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth admitted adultery, committed adultery with her, and merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. We worship God with our resources because it is one of God's protective walls against the deceitful one. The Bible portrays Babylon as a major threat to God's people. Prophetic Babylon, serving intoxicating wine, conveys the idea of deception, Proverbs 21. One of Babylon's final deceptions is to present itself as the source of economic prosperity. This manipulation works well because it appeals to our natural attraction for material gains. Are we not the generation known as lovers of money? 2 Timothy 3.2. How do we stand in resistance to the deception of Babylon? Observing squirrels can teach us a lesson. These cute, furry little creatures often roam in our backyards, but they are cautious not to come too close or are shy when they are approached. However, when their reserves of acorns is almost depleted, this is the time to attract them to you by offering them some nuts. Their need for food leads them to lower their defensive mechanisms. Effective manipulations function in the same way. They appeal to a perceived need. When one experiences a financial crisis, the means to acquire some income becomes particularly attractive. The practice of tithes, systematic offerings, and donations helps us constantly remember that God is the source of true riches. Deuteronomy 8.18. Hence, we do not have to yield to Babylon's manipulative schemes to obtain what we need. Furthermore, the craving for material possessions loses its grip over us when we already appreciate through giving of what we have received. Ellen White wrote, Constant, self-denying benevolence is God's remedy for the cankering sins of selfishness and covetousness. We are called to get out of Babylon. This includes resisting the manipulation of Babylon in issues of finance. Is it safe to neglect is it safe to neglect to give up this protective gear that God has given us? This week, through our tithes and offerings, we can stand in resistance to Babylon. Lord, we face all sorts of temptations to compromise in matters of faith, and we thank you for your instructions given, given for our safeguard. At this time, please bring your tithes and offerings forward.
Again, Father, we have brought our tithes and offerings to you. <clears throat> we say thank you for taking care of us, giving, a, giving us the physically and mental abilities to be out in the workforce. All this comes from you. And now we ask a blessing upon the gift of our tithes and offerings and upon the giver. And we claim the promises that you have given to us as we are faithful with our tithes and offerings in whatever way you deem that is our best. We say thank you for these things we ask in your name. Amen. And now our special music. And I believe this is last Sabbath. We have you. Am I? I hope I'm wrong. Come on, who's that? Happy Sabbath to all of you. I am happy to be here today and I will be singing How Great Thou Art and I pray that you will be blessed by it.
so much, Christine. We really appreciate you using your musical talent here while you've been with us. And uh, I'm sad to see you and Mervyn go. Uh, they, uh, the conference asked us uh, during the time that Ted Wilson was going to be here and the meetings that we would house or uh, let the seminary students have the church. So they've been here and they'll be here till Thursday. And Mervyn was assigned to this church and he's just been a really a great blessing uh, to me personally. And uh, so we're going to miss them. Okay, I realize we're a little bit late, so I don't think I'm going to preach too long here today. I'll talk fast, and you listen fast. <laughs> but we have been doing a Bible prophecy seminar, as you know. We get a kind of a, a pause in it with Pastor Ted Wilson's meetings. And I want to conclude that Bible prophecy seminar with a very important message on the 144,000. Now, I've shared with you that a few years ago, in 2012, we were living in southern Indiana, and there was reports all day that some really bad weather was happening, that there was tornadoes in Illinois, and it was moving our direction. And then <coughs> they started saying, you know, uh, western, western Indiana, tornadoes are touched down. And then there was a big tornado down. And then they showed us exactly the path of where that tornado was going, and our house was right on the path. And they said it just crossed the interstate. We were just a few minutes from the interstate, and it was very shy, a very scary moment because the trees were bending. You've probably seen that before. And my daughter was crying, and we were praying, as, as you can imagine. It was a great big F4 tornado. Well, it actually missed our house by about 12 minutes to the north, but it, it went through a town called Henryville, then it went through a town called Maryville, and it killed 13 people. And it was very sad. And, you know, we went to some of these homes afterwards because we – as a church, we tried to help these people get their, their lives back together, but it was really somber to walk into one of these houses and to realize that a family was just sitting there watching TV and a tornado sucked them out and killed them. And you and I know that these type of things are happening more and more, but I want you to notice what the Bible says here. What God tells these angels, that before all hell breaks loose, God says that he wants to do something. Notice what it says here. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now, by the way, this is all heavily symbolic because are there four corners of the earth? Yes or no? No. So this is obviously, you know, it's a circular earth. So everything, a lot of this in here is symbol, uh, symbolic. So after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or in the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having to seal the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, here's the important part, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have done what, everybody? 
We've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And then it goes on to list the 144,000. And before Christ comes, before this world completely falls apart, God is going to seal his children, and he's going to protect them during this great time of trouble. So we're going to look at this morning, who are these 144,000? Now, if you watch Trinity Broadcasting Network or Daystar or Mood, listen to Moody Radio, their idea of the 144,000 is something like this. Jesus comes for his believers, and there's a seven-year period. And during that seven-year period, you have the reign of the Antichrist. And then you have the rise of 144,000 super Jews. They're like James Bonds. So you got 144,000 James Bond-type people uh, that are Jews who are dismantling the Antichrist. And you know, it's very interesting that a lot of the beliefs on the book of Revelation, they almost want to make them like a Hollywood story, right? But this is not what the Bible teaches, and we're going to look at what Scripture teaches on this subject today. So here's the brief questions that we're going to look at. First of all, we're going to talk about God's end-time soldiers in the tribulation. That's who the 144,000 are. Number two, spiritual Israelites or literal Israel. Okay, Is it actually people with Jewish blood in them, or is it now spiritual Israel in the book of Revelation? Number three, is it a literal number or a symbolic number? Is it only 144,000 people on the earth that are going to stand up against the Antichrist? And then we're going to end with the characteristics of the 144,000. So let me pray with you, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, I want to ask for your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom. Lord, we know that if we live long enough, uh, Christ, uh, or if, um, that some of us in here may see Christ come. And if that's the case, Lord, we definitely want to be a part of this number. So I pray that you'll speak to each and every person. Help us see the solemnity of this message. Help us see the, uh, the encouragement of this message. So bless, speak to every person, we pray in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. Okay, let's start off with the end time soldiers. Now notice what Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says about the end of time. It says, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now if you think about all the terrible atrocities that have taken place on planet Earth, you know, the one that jumps out at me is the Holocaust. And when we were in Germany, we did a little tour of one of the concentration camps. And that concentration camp was called Dachau. And, you know, they went, these prisoners went into Dachau, and they saw those words in German, and, and it says, work for your freedom. And so they got the idea that if we go in here, we work so hard that they will eventually set us free. And as we toured this now kind of a museum-type place, it was very somber to go into the shower room and to realize what had taken place there, and then to go into the crematorium and to see how much pain and suffering took place on this site. You could almost still sense it there in some ways. And to think, though, that the Bible says that the time of trouble at the end of time is going to be greater than all of that chaos that has happened on the earth in, in previous years is really, really quite shocking. Now, notice this verse right here in Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. It says, For the great day of his wrath has come. And then it asks the question, Who is able to stand? So chapter 6 ends with the question. Chapter 7 begins with the 144,000. So the question is, who is able to stand? The 144,000 are able to stand. The 144,000 have that deep commitment with, with Christ. They're going to go through that end time tribulation. All right? Then, Revelation chapter 13 basically ends like this. He causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a what, everybody? A mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So chapter 13 ends talking about the mark of the beast and the persecution that's going to take place of anybody that doesn't go along with it. How does chapter 14 begin? It begins this way. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000 having his father's name written in their forehead. So once again, you see chapter, ends, uh, chapter 13 ends with the Great Tribulation. Chapter 14 then describes 144,000. Now, let me just share with you this with you before we move on to my next point. In the Old Testament, when God, God was up against his enemies, God's people were up against their en God's enemies, they would come, and God never intended his people to have a military. But God wanted them to put down their, their hoes, their rakes, their shovels, and join a military in which he would command them. And a certain amount of young men had to come from this tribe, and this tribe, and this tribe. And so in Revelation, when the 144,000 are mentioned in this way, it's like military language. 
God's people are standing up against the evil apostasy at the end of time. That is what Revelation is teaching, okay? So Joshua and Judges describe certain amounts from each tribe going to battle against God's enemy. The 144,000 will not fight literally, but will stand for God in the closing events. And so, like I said, these popular ideas want to make these guys look like James Bond type people where they're planting explosives and dismantling the Antichrist. Well, that's really humanistic, right? These people, God's people, rely on him, and that's why they're able to stand up here at the end of time. Now, let's go to point number two. This one's very important. Is this spiritual Israel, or is this literal Israel? Well, first of all, notice these points. They cannot be literal Israel. Why? Well, first of all, the book of Revelation is symbolic, and those tribes listed, almost all of them do not exist anymore, right? They were taken off 700 years from the land, 700 years before Christ. They were intermingled. Nobody in here can trace their lineage back to those Jewish tribes. So how could the Bible say 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 that tribe, when they don't even exist anymore? And I've shared this with you before. I told you that, you know, we did that DNA test, and... Uh, I, I put my name on it. We put Eden Spit in it because I kind of know my background. My wife, we know her. You know, she's from her uh, family's from Mexico originally. And I wanted to see how accurate it was that they just didn't kind of look at my name and, and figure it out. So I put my name on it, Eden Spit, and I was really surprised. That it was really spot on. But one thing that surprised me, two things that was pleasantly surprised me was Eden had some African American blood in her, right? One percent, and also she had one percent of Jewish blood in her. Now, you know, now I'm tempted to want to find out who, who one, which one, me or Beatrice, has this. But my daughter had 1% Jewish blood. And probably almost everybody in here has a dab of Jewish blood in them. But you cannot trace yourself back to these tribes. So it's obvious, my friends, logical that this is speaking symbolic. It also says that they're virgins. Does that exclude every single married person? You follow what I'm saying here? So it is symbolic language. Now, let's talk a little bit about this. And by the way, the reformers, the great Christians of old, they all understood this. I don't know how Bible commentators have gotten so off now. But the question is, who is Israel now? And I want you to notice all these clear passages in Scripture on who Israel is in the New Testament. Galatians 3 verse 7 says, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of who, everybody? Okay, so just because somebody has Jewish blood in them does not mean they're a son or a daughter of Abraham. You have to be a child of faith to be a son or a daughter of Abraham. Here's Romans 2, verse 28, Paul writing again to Gentiles. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one, what's that next word, everybody? Inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter. So if you have allowed, by the grace of God, him to circumcise your heart and your mind, Guess what? You are a Hebrew. I am a Hebrew. You are looking at a Jew. I am looking at, by the grace of God, a whole bunch of Jewish people. Okay? Let me just hammer you with some more. Not hammer with you more, but give you some more. Here's a very famous one, Galatians 3, verse 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all are one in Christ, Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. How many of you belong to Jesus Christ? Can I see your hands? Then you're Abraham's children. Okay, you see what it's saying here? How crystal clear? And if you look at the parables of Christ, over and over again, he told the Jewish nation that if they do not get their act together, that he was going to take the kingdom from them and give them then to a different people. And that's exactly what took place in the New Testament. So there's no longer East or West Germany. There's, and the Bible says God has broken down the middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. There's a picture of me in Berlin. And you can see there, the wall came tumbling down. And when Christ died on the cross, and, and a little bit later, the Jewish leaders rejected Christ, that wall of separation came tumbling down. Just two more real quick ones here. Now, this is very fascinating. So James is writing to the Christian church, and I want you to notice that the language he uses. He says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12, what's that next word, everybody? Tribes, tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, these tribes don't exist anymore, so he's not writing to the tribes that you read about in like First and Second Samuel. He's writing to the Christian church, and he calls them now the 12 tribes. So you obviously see a shift in the New Testament from literal Israel 
to spiritual Israel. And of course, I won't read this one, but 1 Peter basically says the same thing. As Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and God made them his people, Christ now led you and I out of Egyptian bondage and we are now his people, spiritual Israel. And so when the Bible says, and so all Israel will be saved, this is not talking about literal Israel if you have Jewish blood in you. It's talking about if you belong to Jesus and that you have let him change your heart and your life. Now, let me just, before I move on to my next point, let me just share a little story with you. I think I might have shared this here uh, a while back. But, um, you know, God still loves the Jewish people. He still works with them on an individual basis. There are several Seventh-day Adventists, very solid Seventh-day Adventists who have Jewish blood in them. And there's a beautiful tract, if you want to go online and read it, it's called The Little Drummer Boy's Prayer. Has anybody ever read The Little Drummer Boy's Prayer before? Just one person, well, treat yourself some Sabbath afternoon, Google it, look up the story, and read it. I'll give you uh, the story in, in just a nutshell. So it takes place during the Civil War. There was a young Christian boy on the battlefield. He was a drummer, and he got, I believe it was his arm shot very badly, or his leg, one of the two. And he goes to the operating table, and the doctor is going to get ready to saw his limb off. And the boy looks up at the doctor and he says, can we please pray together before you do that? And the doctor said, I'm sorry, I'm Jewish, I can't, you know. And so I can't pray your Christian prayer. Well, the, then he begins to saw the boy's limb off, and the boy is crying out to God while he's sawing off his limb that somehow, some way, God will reveal the truth of Jesus Christ to this Jewish doctor. Well, what happens is the boy dies, but the Jewish doctor cannot get the little drummer boy's prayer out of his head, right? And so later on, this Jewish doctor, he's studying the Bible. He's studying Isaiah 53, and he eventually becomes a devout Seventh-day Adventist Christian. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Well, I told you that to tell you this. Uh, years ago, I was flying from Chicago to Los Angeles, and I had a copy of this little booklet in my pocket, thinking, who should I give it to? And I'm sitting down waiting for my flight, and this nice South African gentleman sat next to me, and we were talking. He was very friendly, asked me what I was doing. I told him I was going to the seminary, et cetera, and I was asking him questions. And I thought to myself, and then he told me he was Jewish. And I thought to myself, oh, this is perfect. I brought this book. He's going to take this book on his flight back to South Africa. He's going to read it. He's going to get converted. That's how it all was playing out in my mind. So it, finally they called me for my flight. And I stood up, I shook his hand, said, thank you. you. know, I had a real nice time talking to you. By the way, I'd like to give you this little booklet. I think you're going to find it very, and he looks at it and he goes, no, 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 no. I don't read stuff like that. Sorry. I don't let people proselytize me. That's what he said. And I was so embarrassed. And I, got, and I was so kind of hurt. And I got on the plane and I told my wife, oh, man. But then it hit me. You know what? He was not rejecting me. He was rejecting the love of Jesus Christ. And I was just simply a representative there. And God still loves these people. They have the oracles of God, and many of them are coming to Christ. But as far as God working through the Jewish nation now as his people, that is no longer biblical. Okay? So the Bible says, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. This is talking about spiritual Israel. And now, by the way, let me share this with you. So 12 in the Bible, 12 represents um, wholeness or completeness. That's why when God said the 12 tribes of Israel, they were representing all of his people. When Jesus chose the 12 disciples, they were a representation of the Christian church, all his people. That's why the New Jerusalem, there's one of the reasons why there's 12 gates in the entrance of the city, because it's inclusive. All of God's people can come. And so when it talks about these 12 tribes from all four corners of the earth, it talks about God's people all over the world from Asia, from Africa, from Indonesia, okay? God is gathering his people together, South America, even if he's got some in America. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right, so God is gathering them. That is what it's talking about. Now, let me just briefly mention to you, let's talk a little bit about Israel in the Bible. And Bill did a great job with the Sabbath school today. You know, those of you who are in here, Bill didn't even know he was supposed to teach, but if you were here, he did an excellent job. But Bill, you were taking some of my sermons. So I'll, uh, uh, for those of you here, you got to hear it twice. So, you know, in the Bible, it's often very important to see when a word is first mentioned. And the question is, when is Israel first mentioned? Of course, you know the story. There was a man by the name of Jacob, and his name was changed to Israel. And you know the story of Jacob. You know that he, I guess he was raised as kind of a mama's boy. You know, mom, mom kind of spoiled him a little bit. So he kind of grew up soft, and he kind of grew up, uh, you know, just kind of, 
I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to uh, be too bad on Jacob because I got my own problems. But Jacob then conned his brother out of his birthright. And then Jacob, because his brother was going to kill him, he had to go into hiding, basically, not hiding, but he had to go into captivity or, or the wilderness for basically 20 years. And then Jacob decides to come back to the land. And as he comes back, he realizes that Esau, with a lot of men, is coming out to kill him. And Jacob knows he's defenseless. Jacob knows that he can't fight off all these armed men. And so he goes out and he's praying, he's talking to the Lord. He's thinking about all his sins, all the stupid things he's done, all the times in his life that God wanted him to go this direction and Jacob decided to go that direction. And all of a sudden somebody grabs a hold of him. And as Bill pointed out, the wrestling match began and they wrestled all night long. So what was this wrestling match about? Jacob had lied, cheated, was committing adultery and was not fully surrendered to God. He knew he could not lie and cheat his way out of his brothers wanting to kill him. And here's the point. And this is what we all struggle with. See, I've been in ministry now since 2005. And I will tell you that one of the greatest challenges the Christian faces, whether it's my church or whatever denomination is, am I going to wait? God has promised me something. Am I going to wait on God or am I going to do it my own way? And I could tell you probably, especially those of us who have gray hairs. By the way, somebody said to me, well, you're getting really gray. Uh, on top. I didn't take it as an insult. It's kind of a compliment because that means you've lived, you've made some mistakes. And I could get some of the gray hair people up here and they will tell you that when I've done it my own way, even though I thought it looked good, it ended in uh, most of the time in disaster. And that's what Jacob was fighting against. But then the Lord smote him and uh, he changed his name. He said, you are no longer going to be called Jacob. You are going to be called Israel. Now, here's my definition of what Israel means. One who has overcome self and now relies on God and his word. Can you say amen to that, everybody? That is what a spiritual Israelite is. One has overcome self, wanting to do things their own way, and they now lean and depend on God's word. And if that is you, my friend, then you are a spiritual Jew. You are a child of Abraham, okay? All right, let's go on to the third point. Is this a literal number or symbolic number? Well, there's some debate on this, but I think it's a symbolic number. I'll tell you briefly why. And the, the sub-question, as you can see, is are only 144,000 people going to stand up against the end-time apostasy? And the sub-question is, what is the relationship between the 144,000 and the great multitude? You see, in Revelation chapter 7, you have two groups of people. You've got this great multitude, which no one can number, and you also have this group called the 144,000. Is there a... Um, is there similarities in these two groups? So let's look at this. Well, first of all, these two groups, 144,000, the great multitude, seem to be a different, two different groups at a glance. But a closer look, they appear to be the same group, just simply described differently. Now, let me just share with you a principle in the book of Revelation that you see throughout the book, and that is, it's called the hearing and then the seeing principle. So watch this here now. So here's what Revelation chapter 7 says. And I, what's that next word, everybody? Heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So John up in heaven hears, up in heaven, 144,000 people are sealed. But then what it, goes, what it goes on to say, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Now notice this one here. John says in Revelation chapter 1, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me, a sound voice, uh, behind me a loud voice is a sound of a trumpet. Then he goes on to describe what he heard. And then he says, then I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And then he describes what he sees. So he hears something, then he sees it. Here's another example, Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me. So he hears it and saying, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So that's how he hears it. But notice how he sees it. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. So he hears it a certain way, but he sees it in an entirely different way. In Revelation chapter 7, John hears the number, and then he looks and he says, Whoa, a multitude which no one could number. So it is the same group. The great multitude and the 144,000 are the same group. But here's the point. The 144,000 are described as a military God's people standing up against Satan's people at the end of time, military language. 
But once the great tribulation is passed and we're on the other side to glory, there's no need to describe it as a military anymore. Now God describes it as a great multitude which no man can number. Okay, so that is what I believe Bible prophecy says. Now let me just, um, I'm closing down now, but I wanted to share with you the characteristics and the contrast, the characteristics of the 144,000 and the contrast to those who receive the mark of the beast. Because by the grace of God, I want these characteristics in my own life. So characteristics number one, the Bible says they, what's that next word, everybody? Follow the lamb wherever he goes. You know, in the Old Testament, this expression is used over and over again. Noah walked with God. Enoch walked with God. And the idea is that when you walk with God, he's leading, but you're, he's, it's not like he's dragging you like this, you know, okay? That's not the idea. And it's not like you're rushing off and you're pulling Jesus in this direction. You are gently walking with God and you're following him as he leads. And that is a huge, huge characteristic of the 144,000. Notice the contrast here. Those at the end of time, Revelation 13, verse 3. And all the world marveled and, what's that next word, everybody? Follow the beast. You see the two? Some follow the lamb, some follow the, uh, the deception at the end of time. Number two, they have no deceit in their mouths. But notice the end time apostasy, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming up out of their mouths of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet and out of the mouth of false prophets. So you get the idea. No deceit comes out of God's people's mouths. They're honest people. But great deceit comes out of the Antichrist system at the end of time, and people believe it. Number three, they are virgins. And notice the contrast here with uh, what the devil does. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So what does it mean that God's people are virgins? Are they perfect? No, they're not perfect, but they depend on God's word. They do not compromise with God's word. If God's word says it very clearly, they follow that word. The devil's people at the end of time, they might do it a little bit, but ultimately they want to follow their own inclinations. God's people drink of the cup that Jesus drank of, and that is thy will be done. That is the 144,000. Number four, they have their father's character in their foreheads. Now it's called different things in the Bible. It's called his name, which means his character. It's called his seal, which represents his law, which is also God's character. But notice what the devil's people get at the end of time. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So you see the contrast here. And lastly, they are obedient to all of God's commandments. Revelation 14, verse 12. But notice this group here. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast. I lied. I got one more. And the last point I want to make about the 144,000 is that they proclaim the three angels of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 12. I know of only one group of people on this planet that is proclaiming this message right here. And that, of course, is the Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, when I did uh, my dissertation on discipleship and had to write a lot about it and had to read a whole bunch of discipleship, and many churches had some great programs on discipleship. Excellent. I adopted a lot of them. But one of our authors said something very interesting. I thought this was, this was profound. He said that the goal of Adventist discipleship is to create the people found in Revelation chapter 14. That's what your and my goal is, to become like this by the grace of God, to follow him wherever he leads. To be, to, uh, the Bible says they're faultless before his throne because they have Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. Christ is their all in all. Christ's mission is their mission, and they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, you know what? Whoa, I am so far from the 144,000, their characteristics. There's no hope for me. I'm going to be lost. Well, let me share this with you. You know, there's a beautiful book called Steps to Christ. I've read it probably 10 times, and I'll probably read it at least 10 times before I die. And there's a prayer in that book. And I've known several church members who in the morning, throughout their struggles with temptation, their struggles with anger, their struggle with problems, they pray this prayer to God every single morning. And if you do this and you have your daily devotions, you will grow, my friends. You'll become a beautiful, beautiful child of God and be ready when the harvest comes. So here's the quotation. This is the prayer that we should pray every morning. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. 
Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? That should be the prayer of our hearts. Let me close down now with a story I read in a book uh, years ago. Somebody gave me a book on Islam. It was a good book um, written by a Christian fellow who was a Muslim and he became a Christian. And at the beginning of the book, he told the story of Fatima, but he didn't tell the concluding part of the story. And so I looked at every single page before I read the book to find what actually happened to her. It's a gripping, gripping story. And I want you to notice what it, uh, it says. So she was a brilliant young Muslim lady from a strict Muslim part of Saudi Arabia. And she became a strict Muslim herself, doing things like fasting every Monday and Thursday. And she decided to enter a university, and she did a paper on fanatic Muslims who became moderate. She was doing a master's thesis, but she needed examples. And so she got on some of these chat forums, and she was talking with, you know, a lot of different Muslims. And throughout her, uh, during her time there, she met a former fanatical Muslim who became a Christian. And he challenged her beliefs in Islam to the extent that she realized in, uh, Islam, the historical beliefs that they have are absolutely false. And so now she doesn't know what to do with her life. And she, now she's just decided, well, I'm going to be an atheist. Well, that didn't bring her any satisfaction to her soul. And so one night she prayed this prayer. She looked up into the heavens and she said, Lord, tell me clearly who you are. Where is the road that leads to you? Now let me ask you this, my friends. If you pray a prayer like that from an honest heart, do you think that God's going to guide and lead your life, yes or no? Oh, you better believe it. That's the people he's come for, right? So she decided to check out this Muslim Christianity discussion forums, and there she found on this forum the entire Gospel of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, turning the other cheek. Now, that's not practice in certain parts of the world in the countries that, she, that she's from, right? Now, notice this right here. In that first setting, when she first saw that the Gospel of Matthew on this chat forum, she read it four times. Four times. Now I think to myself, how often does all these Bibles, I used to have a Bible that had archaeology facts in it. I have a Bible that has this comments and this comments, and how little I read my Bible compared to this girl. She was like a thirsty dog, and she was reading it. And uh, she downloaded it, and as she was waiting for buses and different things like that, she would pull out. That's all she had of the Bible. She only had the Gospel of Matthew, right? Well, you know how it is. She cried out, and she said, but you are my God. It's you I've been looking for miss, m from my childhood. She surrendered her life to Christ. Now, she was advised by her online friends to keep her faith quiet, but you know how it is when you meet Jesus and when you surrender your life to him, you can't keep quiet, especially to those who you love. And she let it slip out one day to her brother and to her mother that she was a Christian. Her brother was a fanatical Muslim, and he went and searched her computer, and he found that she was witnessing for Christ on the computer. Now, in that part of the world... He could do this legally, that if she did not renounce her faith in Christ, he could execute her. And he told her, he said, I'm going to give you four hours to renounce your belief in Jesus Christ. And if you will not do that, I'm going to come back and I'm going to execute you. Well, she went over to her computer during that little brief time. She went over to her computer and she wrote these words. May the Lord Jesus guide you, O Muslims, and lighten your hearts that you might love others. We worship the Lord Jesus, the light of the world, and every man is free to choose any religion. Be content to leave us to ourselves and be believers in Jesus. There are tears on my cheek, and oh, the heart is sad to those who become Christians, how cruel you are to them. Your threats do not trouble me. I am unto death a Christian. I cry for what passed by of a sad life. I was far from the Lord Jesus for many years. You see, Jesus is my Lord, and he is the best. Jesus the Messiah, the light of clear guidance that he may change beliefs and set the scales of, just, uh, set the scales of just, uh, justice rightly, and that he spread among you love, O Muslims. Well, her brother did come home, and she went back down in her walk with God, and he executed her. He killed her. But you know, on that day when Christ comes back, when the lightning flashes from the east to the west, and Christ comes back to gather all his children from the four corners of the earth. I believe we're going to meet this young lady. Died at a very young age. But by the grace of God, she died as a spiritual Jew, ready for Jesus to come. Can you say amen to that, everybody? That's where I want to be. And that's my prayer for you this morning. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.
And I'd like to ask the baptismal candidates when this, the song is over, Vincent, and uh, your mom, and uh, Monday, and your son, if you'll join me in the hall right there so when people pass by, they can congratulate you on your baptism. Okay, Renee. Okay. Hymn number 522. My hope. Let us pray. Our Father, as we conclude our seminar and our study of the book of Revelation, and we see these people, the 144,000, is our great desire to be a part of them. Not because we want to show off for throughout eternity, but Lord, because we love you. We want to stand for you. We want to be ambassadors for you. But Lord, we are all so weak. We all have our things that we struggle with. So help each and every person in here grow. Help us, dear God, if there are things blocking our relationship with, the, uh, with you, please give us strength to overcome them. And may we be say on that beautiful day, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. Just like they, all the redeemed will say when they stand at the end. In Jesus' name we pray, let everybody say, amen. amen.